Okay, so um, as I said, the Old Guard in Europe, and Doyle talks about this, so you should be familiar with it. Um, the, the ruling elites in Europe are very, very happy with the Civil War um, because they think it, it's, it marks the end of the Republican experiment, which is what they called it, uh, in the United States. And if the U.S. fails, then democracy as a model of government fails globally. You know, I've talked about this, and this is really what you should think about when you read um, the um, Gettysburg Address, because this is very much what Lincoln was thinking as well. Uh, for him, you know, it, it's a little disenchanting to find out that for Lincoln, emancipation was always a secondary goal. Uh, it's not the Lincoln that we have been taught to respect and, and even uh, revere. Um, but Lincoln's whole point was that the, the key thing for him, anyway, was democratic government. And the survival uh, of the United States meant the survival of uh, democracy on a global scale. But here's what happens uh, in the 1860s. Not only is democratic government threatened uh, in the United States, beginning in early 1862, democratic government is also threatened in Mexico, next door to the United States. So what you have, and, and this is, um, I'm not trying to be brag too much here, but this is kind of where I've made my mark um, in Civil War history, uh, or in the study of the Civil War, with an article that I published uh, a few years back. What you have uh, during the 1860s, it's a continental war. It's a North American war. Uh, it's, a, it's a North American conflict. And what I argue, and, and I'll spell this out in this podcast today, is that the U.S. Civil War is very, very much connected, or there are strong connections between the U.S. Civil War and what's going on in neighboring Mexico in 1862. And this is how people in Europe saw it. This is how people in the United States and the Confederacy saw it as well. They saw the connections very clearly. We had lost the connections in my, this is what I argue anyway, uh, up until fairly recently. And what, I've, what I'm trying to do in, in my work is to reestablish the connections. So what I call this period of history, I call it the North American crisis of the 1860s because I'm trying to get historians to think continentally. I'm trying to think, get historians to think out of the box that is created by uh, the boundaries of the United States. Uh, this is what historians call transnational history. Uh, my mentor at NYU, a really wonderful man named Thomas Bender, he's one of the pioneers in this modern notion of transnationalism. And he, you know, he's had a big influence on me. And this kind of transnational school, which is, I think, very, very convincing, uh, is trying to get historians to look beyond borders. And I, I have to tell you, if if you were taking this course, I don't know, in 2010, right? I still was teaching the Civil War within a box created by the boundaries of the United States. I didn't talk about Mexico at all. Uh, I didn't think about the, the global struggle between you know kingship and, and d democracy. So all this thinking is really uh, pretty relatively new. Uh, and it's gotten, it's become widespread very, very quickly. So it's, to me, it's very exciting to be kind of part of that, that overall movement. Okay, so let's go to Mexico. As, of course, you know, the, the war breaks out in the U.S. in April of 1861. Now, once the war breaks out in the United States, once the Civil War breaks out, people in Europe start licking their chops, because they realize that the United States is so tied up in trying to defeat the Confederacy that it doesn't have much international clout anymore. Before the Civil War, the, the U.S. government had proclaimed what it was called the Monroe Doctrine. And the Monroe Doctrine, it was named after uh, President Monroe, and it was issued in the 1820s, Basically, what the Monroe Doctrine said was to Europe, stay out of the Western Hemisphere. 
uh, we don't want you here. We don't need you here. Just stay out. We don't want you conquering uh, any parts of Central uh, America, Mexico, or South America. And if you do, we will fight you. So what you had, U.S. policy, basic U.S. policy from the 1820s until the time of the Civil War, was basically a warning to Europe via the Monroe Doctrine for old world European governments, which of course were monarchies, right? They, they're run by kings, to stay out of the Western Hemisphere. And the Monroe Doctrine is not really about the U.S. It's really about Mexico, uh, South America, Central America. And just a kind of a brief digression, but I think it's important to say, don't forget that that uh, Spain had been kicked out of the Western Hemisphere by the in the 1820s. Uh, that's when Mexico gains its independence, Peru, Colombia, Argentina. By the by, the middle of the 1820s, Spain is kicked out of the Western Hemisphere completely, and so what you have is this idea of the New World. Uh, it's a world that's free of European influence. In theory, there was always European influence in the Western Hemisphere, especially economic uh, influence, because Europe was by far the wealthiest region of the world. But when it came to conquering territory, uh, Europe was kicked out of the Western Hemisphere. And the Monroe Doctrine basically told Europe, keep your asses out of here. We don't want you. Okay, after the Civil War starts, Lincoln is unable to enforce the Monroe Doctrine. Why? Because, of course, he's in a fight for his life with the Confederacy. So there's not much he can do if European powers want to come into the New World. He's just stretched too thin, and he knows it. Uh, he can issue all kinds of warnings to European powers, but he can't enforce it militarily because he just can't. Because, you know, you can only fight. His saying was one war at a time. Uh, he just said only one war at a time. Okay, so the the Civil War then opens up opportunities for European powers to come in, back into the New World, okay? Because the Monroe Doctrine, Lincoln can't really enforce it. This takes us to Napoleon III of Europe. Now, the, Napoleon III was the nephew of the Emperor Napoleon, who, of course, ruled France from the late uh, 1790s until uh, 1815 or so. And so Napoleon III was his nephew. He was a very crafty fellow. He'd actually spent time in the U.S. Uh, he was very familiar with Central America. Um, in 1848, he was always trying to reestablish him, himself in, uh, in France. He, what, what he had, the big advantage that he had, was he had the name Napoleon. And that carries a lot of weight. I mean, look at today's politics. I mean, you had a Bush, although he didn't do very well. Um, uh, you have a Clinton running for uh, president. You know, a, a name is kind of a branding, and it can take you a long way uh, in, in politics. So Napoleon III was always looking for a chance in Europe now to reestablish himself. And this is what he does. In the confusion of the uh, revolutions of 1848, Napoleon III, it opens up a door for him to become basically the, the dictator of France, which by the by the early 1850s, Napoleon III has been the dictator of France. He manages to regain power uh, in France or gain power in France. Uh, he gets a lot of support from other folks in Europe, some, from conservatives in France um, that want uh, another kind of a king or a monarch. And uh, so by the early 1850s, Napoleon III becomes kind of the poster child of those folks that, that shut down the European revolutions of 1848. Okay, so Napoleon III reestablished in Europe um, in the 1850s. And when the U.S. Civil War breaks out, he cast his eye towards Mexico. He had always been very, very interested in Mexico. Uh, he was, he'd been interested in capturing the silver mines in kind of north-central Mexico. He was very interested in either building a canal or a railroad in the... Um, uh, the 
the southern portion, the southern isthmus of Mexico, where Mexico gets narrow. Um, uh, and note, you know, it's it's the French engineers that start building the Panama Canal further south later in the century. So Napoleon III looks to Mexico for economic reasons, but he also looks to Mexico because he sees a chance to reestablish monarchical government, a king in the Western Hemisphere.